This morning's scripture reading will come out of the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. Again, that is uh, Matthew, chapter 5, 27 through 30. I will be reading from the New King James Version, and the scriptures read as follow. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body to be cast into hell. Good morning. Appreciate so very much your presence this morning, especially those of you who are visiting and taking the time out of your day, your busy schedule to be with us. We're grateful that you've chosen to come here. We hope that uh, you won't be disappointed by your visit. We hope you'll hang around and visit with us after services and get to know us a little better. And most of all, we hope you'll come back uh, and visit us again and again. We want you to know that we are open to your questions and comments. If you should have any of them, uh, of a biblical nature, we'd be more than happy to discuss them with you. And if, you, of course, if you have questions about the lesson, uh, I will be happy to answer those questions for you as well. I really appreciate Brother Jared's remarks at the table, and, and you can just summarize the whole thing with just the name Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. And you just think about that in your own personal life. And I've talked to a few people this morning uh, about these various things and how uh, sometimes in our lives things just happen to just fit together at the right time and the right place and the right circumstances and I was even having that conversation with my son I went to see him over the last couple of days my son and my daughter-in-law and my perfect little granddaughter and he was talking about how things just come together sometimes and I said those coincidences aren't coincidences they're just not the Lord provides he provides for us in a material way and especially those of us who live in the United States we are so blessed I don't believe there's a person in this room who's starving. Uh, if there is, you let us know about that. We'll fix that in about five seconds. There, there's, we're so blessed. We have nice homes. We come here in late model automobiles. We're able to give to the Lord. Uh, and then you, you just go beyond the physical and you think about the spiritual. The Lord provided a sacrifice in Jesus Christ that makes possible the forgiveness of any transgression, any transgression that you might commit. It can be forgiven by the blood of Christ on the conditions God has set forth in His Word. We must put our faith in that sacrifice, Jesus Christ, and we must obey the Lord. And if we do that, any sins, any transgressions can be forgiven. And so over and over and over again, the Lord provides, and we are so grateful for that. Now, with all of that said, I want to get into the lesson this morning. And as you can see, it's not a very pleasant subject. It's something, I'd, there's about 10,000 other things I would rather preach about than this subject. The problem of pornography and I chose Matthew 5 to introduce it let's take a look at that text again Matthew 5 27 you have heard that it was said to those of old you shall not commit adultery but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart if your right eye causes you to sin pluck it out and cast it from you for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell and if your right hand causes you to sin cut it off and cast it from you, for it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Jesus is saying here that heaven and hell hangs in the balance in regard to this matter of lust. And lust is directly connected to pornography, the issue of pornography. And a lot of folks, uh, I think, misread the Sermon on the Mount. They think Jesus is bringing a bunch of new teaching, especially when they talk about, well, you've heard that it was said, but I say to you. And they say, Jesus is bringing in new stuff. I deny that. Jesus is not bringing in new stuff, not even here, not even in this passage. They say, well, the law of Moses said you should not commit adultery, but Jesus said you shouldn't lust. No, the law of Moses said you shouldn't lust. You ever read the 10th commandment? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. That's not a new commandment. That's old. That's always been the truth. Jesus is actually clarifying the law. Uh, the Jews, with their traditions, had put all their traditions around the law and, and had perverted and corrupted the law. And bring, Jesus is bringing it back to its original purity and clarifying it for us and helping us to understand that the root of sin 
begins in the heart. And that's true with the sin of adultery. Adultery is a sin, has always been a sin, but it is, it, it, there is a process before you get there. There is a lusting process, and that begins in the heart. And so that's the gist of that text. We'll probably return to that text later in the lesson, but I think it makes a fitting introduction to the subject of pornography, as unpleasant as it is. Uh, this is a needed subject. I don't know how many of you realize this, but there are many, many, many people who struggle with this, and sadly, many of them are Christians. There are some Christians who struggle with it. It may come as a surprise to you. I would never think that a Christian would have issues with this. Oh, yes. There are Christians who have issues with pornography. And when you think about the, the pornography industry, it is one of the most, most lucrative industries in the entire world. I don't know if you knew that or not, but if you start digging into this and, fig, and, and, and looking into the facts and figures, literally billions upon billions of dollars are spent on this sin, and that makes it Satan's most lucrative enterprise. Now, I say that, and you might say, well, Satan doesn't need any money, and that's true. But the point I'm making is when, when we support this, when we give money to this and pay money for this, and sometimes you may not realize it, but you're paying money for it just by clicking on a website here or there, whether it may say free, but sometimes there's advertisements connected to it, and money goes into the coffers of the pornography industry. And so when you pay money for this, you are supporting the devil's work. Think of that for just a second. How is it that we can come in here, and Brother Jared has talked about how we lay by in store, and we've got the little black boxes back there, and we put our contribution. How do you contribute and support the Lord's work, and then turn right around and contribute to that? How is it that you can do that? And so this is an important subject, uh, unpleasant indeed, but it is important and we need to address it. And I, I want to give you a little note on how I shall proceed. Like most of my sermons, not all of them, but like most of my sermons, i got four main points. And I will quickly run through probably the first three points with very few scripture. I'm saving the scripture for the end. It's just the way that I put the lesson together. Most of the previous stuff, the first three points, will be definitional type material helping us to understand, helping us to define exactly what it is that we're talking about because I think sometimes people have a very narrow or limited understanding of just exactly what pornography is. And so we're going to make sure that we clarify that and make sure that you understand exactly what we're talking about as we address this subject. Let's begin, of course, with the definition of pornography, the Greek word, and you can see uh, pornography there, that actually comes from two Greek words. They've been anglicized and brought over into the English. The Greek word porno or pornea, depending upon uh, which form the word takes, but porno or pornea means fornication or harlotry. And so we have the first half of the word, and then you have the second half, grapho. And the word grapho means writing or pictures. Now let that sink in for just a minute, and let me illustrate it for you. Uh, we, we talk about taking a photograph. That's a picture, isn't it? And then sometimes you see a famous person and you ask for an autograph. And so you see the same word, grapho. And so grapho can refer to pictures and grapho can refer to writings. It can refer to both, to either or to or, writings or pictures. And that's literally the, the Greek word behind that, pictures of fornication, writings about fornication. Things having to do with fornication or harlotry. Mr. Webster, in his English dictionary of the word pornography, says this. It is the depiction of erotic behavior, as in pictures or writing, intended to cause sexual excitement. Now, let me break that down for just a second. Depiction, depiction, that's the idea of, of putting something out there and, and painting a picture for us. So the depiction, and you can paint a picture with words, by the way. Uh, writers do that all the time, preachers do that all the time when they speak, and so you can paint a word picture if you please. So the depiction of erotic behavior, erotic behavior is that which has to do with sexual behavior, sexual conduct. So it is the depiction of sexual behavior, and even in the, in the English dictionary it says pictures or writing. That's what I was trying to say to you earlier about the Greek word, pictures or writing. And then thirdly, intended to cause sexual excitement. Someone might say, well, why would anybody write about this? Why would anybody write about fornication? Why would anybody write about harlotry? Why would anybody take pictures of fornication? Why would people take pictures of harlotry? Well, because it's intended to arouse sexual excitement. There's, there's a whole, uh, and that ties us in with Matthew 5, doesn't it? The lust, 
A man who looks upon a woman to lust for her. And by the way, even though Jesus is talking about a man looking upon a woman, it goes the other way just as well. It's just as wrong for a woman to look upon a man and lust as it is for a man to look upon a woman. That sin goes both ways. It cuts in both directions. And so we need to recognize that. And so putting that all together, what you end up with is pictures or writings of fornication or harlotry or some other sexual sin. And so this is just a, a basic definition, a thumbnail definition, if you please. That definition is large enough, when you think about the meaning of all the words involved, it's large enough to include literature, writings. There are pornographic writings that people buy and read all the time. Some of these so-called romance novels that some ladies buy uh, is pornographic in its nature. That's exactly what it is. Uh, there's no, maybe there's no dirty pictures in there, but there's a lot of dirty writing. There's a lot of dirty things being said and a lot of dirty things being done. That's pornography, my friends. That's exactly what it is. We have to understand that. And it includes pictures and it includes movies. As I was thinking about that this morning, back in the, in, before movies were invented, you used to just have photographs of this or that or the other. And then they finally invented uh, movies. And you know what the first name, what we, today we just use the word movies, but the first name was motion pictures. So a movie uh, is just a moving picture. That's exactly what it is. So that's a picture. And so whether it's pictures or writing, that, that definition, in other words, is broad enough to include books, literature, writings. It's broad enough to include photographs and pictures, and it's broad enough to include movies. All of that would be included in the definition of pornography. Now we're going to talk about some examples. We're going to try and get a little bit more specific in this. Uh, we've, we've kind of defined the thing, but let's talk about some examples of pornography. First of all, pornography can include, and I put this word in quotation marks, mere nudity. Now, so when I say that, I put it in quotation marks. I don't want you to think that I think nudity is a, is a, is a nothing. It is not a nothing. But when I say mere nudity, people say, well, it's just a naked picture. It's just nudity. Well, that's pornography. Why is that? Because looking at nude bodies can be sexually alluring, and that fits into the definition of pornography, doesn't it? That's exactly what it is. And so even if it's just a nudie picture, as people say, and, and nothing's happening, nobody's doing anything except somebody's there nude. Somebody's there naked. Well, that's sexually alluring. And so that fits into the definition of pornography. But sometimes that's not enough for some people. And by the way, this is a sin that is progressive in its nature. Uh, it starts in the heart. That's what Jesus was telling us in Matthew 5, that adultery begins in the heart. And so you have this lustful heart that has to be satisfied. And maybe for a little while a person can be satisfied with just looking at nude pictures, but then it progresses on. I've got to have more. I've got to see more. And so what we see depicted then become erotic or sexual words and acts. That is a next level kind of thing. It takes this to the next level. And so you get pictures and writings about fornication itself, the act itself. Not just nude people, but the act of fornication. The act of adultery, depicted, pictured in words or in movies or in pictures. You get this uh, in the homosexual community as well. There is homosexual pornography that is geared toward uh, homosexual men and homosexual women, lesbianism, you see. And that's depicted in pornography. And I hate to even say the words, but we have to because of the topic. But you have images of bondage and images of sadomasochism and images of bestiality. And I know that's repulsive. It's repulsive to me to even say it. It really is. But my friends, we've got to understand this is a big problem in our country. And it is a big problem even among some who claim to be Christians. And any or all of those kinds of things, whether it's just the, the mere nudie pictures or whether it's the pictures that take it a little bit further into the actual acts of sexual immorality, all of that falls into place. And whether it's writing, just writing about it and talking about it in literature, whether it's pictures, whether it's movies, whether it's videos, whether it's CDs, whether it's on the Internet, it all falls into the same category. And really the technology just enables them to do this in a bigger way. It's not a new thing at all. It's just that the technology allows them to do it in a bigger way and in a more uh, effective way to reach the public, you see. Well, let's make some applications of this. Let's get specific here. 
pornographic magazines. Years ago, people that ordered these in the mail, they would have them discreetly mailed to their home. And it, was, it would come into someone's home in a, brown, a plain brown wrapper. Now, when you go out to the mailbox and you pick up the plain brown wrapper, everybody in the, in the neighborhood knows exactly what's in the plain brown wrapper. And yet somehow or another, you see, they think, well, that's secret. Nobody knows because it's in a plain, no, everybody knows. Everybody in the neighborhood knows what you're pulling out of your mailbox, you see. And so you have the pornographic magazines. There are pornographic movies that go on for quite some time telling a story of sexual immorality, one encounter after another after another, you see. There are, in fact, if you, if you turn on your TV and you start going through the channel, now you may not have those channels, and hopefully you don't have those channels, but they'll show up on the screen. They'll show up as an options, you see. And so you have pornographic channels on the cable that, that, that people will buy that people will purchase and people will look at and people will watch, you see. And so there are pornographic channels that people can watch. And think about that. Now you don't have to go out there to the mailbox and, and embarrassingly pull out the brown paper wrapper. Now you can just have it piped into your home and nobody knows except the Lord. The Lord knows and you know. And you know exactly what's going on. So it's piped in uh, on your channel, on your cable, you see, or can be piped into your home in that way. And websites multitudes of pornographic websites that people click on every day. In fact, I read something not long ago. It might be in the bulletin article. I have a two-part bulletin article that goes along with the sermon this week, by the way, and please read those. Uh, but it, it occurs to me that, now my thought done left me. But anyway, you've got, these, you, you've got the pornographic websites. You have some, as we continue to make application here, you have some mainstream movies that are pornographic in nature. Parents, pay attention here. Mainstream movies. When I was a kid, uh, movies were rated R and X and G. And, and sometimes they, they, they later on they brought in this uh, NC-17 kind of thing, an NC-13. But the old X-rated movies are now called NC-17. So when you're looking at movies and you see it says NC-17, there's a good chance that that's pornographic or very, very violent, or both. And so NC-17 is what the old X used to be. When people saw X, they knew that was a, that was a dirty movie. And so now today, NC-17, R-rated movies aren't a whole lot better. And let me tell you a little secret, parents. PG-13 sometimes is not fitting for 13-year-olds. That's supposed to be. They say, well, it's okay for 13-year-olds as long as the parents with them. And, and when you start watching, you find out, oh, no, this is not okay for 13-year-olds, even if the parents are with them. It's not okay. It's not. Be careful. You can't trust that rating system. And why is that, by the way? Because it isn't Christians that are putting the ratings on. It's worldly people. It's worldly people who really don't think this is that big of a deal in the first place. And so they put the ratings on to kind of pacify the world, the community out there. But sometimes things pass through as PG-13 that isn't fit for 13-year-olds to watch. And let me just make a, a concrete application of this. A few years back, it hadn't been all that long ago, there was a whole series of movies that went out, very popular series of movies. Fifty Shades of Grey. That's pornography, my friends. That's all that it is. It is flat out, absolute pornography. No Christian should be watching that. No Christian should be paying attention to that. So I want you to see the hard and fast applications of this. You think it hasn't touched your life? Maybe it has. Maybe it has. You think this isn't going to bother you? Maybe it has. Maybe it does bother you. Maybe it has affected your life. There are levels of pornography, by the way. Many times when we talk about this, most people are just thinking in terms of the hardcore porn, and, and certainly there is that. But there's also a little something out there called soft porn. But notice the word, porn. It's still porn. Soft porn. And you'll find that sometimes in the romance novels that people buy. And when they're read, very descriptive depictions are made. Maybe not in photographs. But verbally, this depictions are made of sexual activity, you see. And yes, they're less graphic, but they're still titillating, and therefore they still fit the definition of pornography. 
And so we have to understand that this may come down to us in ways that we don't even realize. And sometimes we, we see something and we don't classify it as pornography, but it is. Because our definition as Christians is going to be a little bit different than the world. The world is going to be talking about hardcore porn. And they say, yeah, most people will say, yeah, that's bad, but. And they always throw the but on there like it's not that bad. But for the Christian, that definition becomes much more n narrowed down to some other things, like the soft core stuff, like the literature, like the romance novels that sometimes are read. And in fact, I would argue that pornography can include filthy talk, filthy talk between unmarried people. Let me give you a scripture here. Now we're going to start bringing in some scriptures here. Let's start with Ephesians 5. In Ephesians 5, verses 3 through 7, Paul says, But fornication, now stop and remember that pornea, porno, the first part of that word has to do with fornication. But fornication and all uncleanness, the word uncleanness there is not talking about someone who's physically unclean doesn't take a bath. It's talking about moral uncleanness. And, and notice it's right on the heels of the word fornication. And so fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. Now I know the definition of covetousness can be broad, but in this context, look at this context, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. Link that in with Matthew 5, 28, lusting for another man's wife, lusting for someone you have no business lusting for. That's that kind of covetousness. Think of that. Let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Let not that even be named, he says. That's how bad this is. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting. I think the old King James says, just says jesting, and that can be a little misleading. He's not talking about just telling jokes, but he's talking about dirty jokes. That can be pornographic. That can be pornographic, you see. So filthy talking, the flirtatious talking, and the coarse jesting, the coarse joking, which are not fitting. Instead of all that, he says, the giving of thanks. Wouldn't it be better, instead of wasting our words talking about filthy things, that we used our words to thank God for all of his blessings? I started off with that, didn't I? Jehovah Jireh, God provides. Let's start talking to God, and let's start thanking God. Instead of talking about all this filthy stuff, and, and, and reveling in this filthy stuff, and making as though it was a good thing when it's not, he says, instead, let's be giving thanks to God. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. That's a fancy way of saying you ain't going to heaven. You ain't going to heaven if you're doing this stuff. You're not going. But I've been baptized. You're not going. If you're doing this stuff, you're not going. You've got to make some changes here. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. You're doing this, you're a son of disobedience. You're doing this, you're hell bound. Got to make some changes. Got to rectify some things in your life. Therefore, verse 7, do not be partakers with them. There is no room for exceptions here. He's pretty explicit and he's pretty plain about this. You cannot do this, even right down to the filthy talk and the coarse jesting. And so we, we've got to understand, as Christians, we are called to a higher standard. We're called to a standard of purity and a standard of holiness. And I might point out here, by the way, as you read through those verses, you might say, well, he's talking to worldly people. I, I, I call to your attention that he's writing this to a church. He's writing this to a church. In fact, in verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love. He's writing to Christians and he's saying, this is a problem among Christians. This happens among Christians, which is what I started off with, wasn't it? And so it was a problem in the first century among Christians. And it's a problem today among Christians. So we need to be very careful here. We need to understand what this is all about. Now in the rest of the lesson, I want to talk about some very pertinent scriptures, aside from the one I just read, some very pertinent scriptures. So this is where we bring all the scriptures to bear. Let's go back, first of all, to the Old Testament book of Job. Job chapter 30, excuse me, 31 and verse 1. And remember what I, you know, I told you earlier about Matthew 5. You know, people say, that's new. 
Jesus said, uh, the old law said adultery was wrong. Jesus come along and says lust is wrong. No, no, it was wrong in the Old Testament. Look here at Job, verse, verse 1. I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? That sounds a lot like what Jesus said. That's not new. What Jesus brought in was not new teaching. It was not new doctrine. It was in the law of Moses, in the 10th commandment, and it's right here in the book of Job. In fact, the book of Job predates the law of Moses. The book of Job, the oldest book in the Bible. And Job says, I've made a covenant with my eyes. I'm going to pay attention to what I'm looking at, and I'm not going to look at things that I shouldn't be looking at. I'm not going to be looking at young women, Job says. And so, again, the idea of the connection to pornography is quite obvious. Let's go back to Matthew 5, and let's go over these verses once again a little bit more detailed here. Matthew 5, verse 27 through 30. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. Most people say, yep, that's right, that's right, that's right. We shouldn't do that, and it's true. But Jesus said, this all begins in the heart. This doesn't, you know, sometimes when people get wrapped up in this sin, they'll say, well, I didn't mean it, it just happened. No, it doesn't just happen. Adultery doesn't just happen. You start cooking it up in your mind long before it ever happens. And verse 28 is trying to tell us that. I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Oh, you haven't done the act, but in your heart you have. The only thing missing is the opportunity. The only thing missing is the chance. The only thing missing is the invitation you see. But in your heart and in your mind, it's already there. Jesus said this unacceptable. You've already done this in your heart. You've already sinned in your heart. And then, verse 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now critics of the Bible, they'll look at that and say, I can't believe that God would tell you to pluck out your eye. That's terrible. I can't believe that God would tell you to cut off your hand. Have you ever heard of hyperbole? That's what this, this is hyperbole. Hyperbole is exaggeration to make a point. The Lord is making a point here. And just to illustrate hyperbole, you know, we do this with our kids all the time. If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. Well, it hasn't been a thousand, maybe 950. But you're exaggerating to make a point, you see. You're exag and the Lord is exaggerating. He's not saying for you to literally pluck out your eye. By the way, the problem here is not the eye. The problem's the heart. That's the whole point. He's committed adultery in his heart. Plucking out your eye is not going to solve the heart problem. That's, that's the point here. What he's saying here, by cutting off the eye and cutting off the hand, he's saying don't feed the desire. Let me make it real for you. If that laptop's causing you a problem and you can't stop clicking on the pornographic websites, throw away the laptop. You can get by without it. We did for years. Long before there were computers, we got by just fine. If that laptop's a problem, throw it away. That's, that's the ideal of cut off your hand and pluck out your eye. You, you deal with it. You don't feed the desire. You deal with it. You cut off those things that are causing the problem. You stay away from the places and the circumstances that are causing the problem. That's the ideal of plucking out your eye and cutting off your hand. Let's go back to the Old Testament book of Proverbs, chapter 4. Proverbs, chapter 4. I had said earlier that this is a hard issue. It's a hard issue. And in Proverbs 4, verse 23, notice what the writer says. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. You see, what you entertain in your heart eventually becomes manifest in your life. That's what he's saying here. If you're entertaining thoughts of adultery and fornication in your heart, it will eventually manifest itself in your life. If you're viewing pornography because you have that in your heart, eventually it's going to manifest itself in other ways besides just viewing pornography. You know how many, you know how many people who are addicted to pornography become rapists? That happens because they crave that next level. And so keep your heart. By the way, keep your heart. He's not talking about that little thing going thumpity, thumpity, thump in your chest. The Bible heart. The Bible heart is up here between the ears. The Bible heart is the mind, you see. And so keep your mind. Watch what you think about. Watch what you're focused on. And with that in mind, I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me over to Matthew chapter 15. 
Matthew chapter 15. And here Jesus is talking about the heart and how sin proceeds from the heart. That's, that's what we're talking about here. How sin proceeds from the heart. And he says in verse 18, Those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart, verse 19 is the key, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Notice he's not limiting it to just pornography here. He says a lot, all sin comes out of the heart. That's why the writer of Proverbs said, keep your heart with all diligence. Again, remember, this is the Bible heart between the ears. This is the Bible heart. Keep your heart. Watch your brain. Watch what you're thinking of because out of that brain, what you're thinking about, what you're focusing on, that manifests itself in your life, whether it's looking at pornography or even taking it to another level, such as rape and things of this nature. These are the things, verse 20, which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Take your Bibles now and turn with me over to the book of Galatians chapter 5. And Paul talks about the works of the flesh. And someone says, oh, but preacher, you won't see the word pornography on that list. Oh, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. In Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. Done. That's pornography right there, every bit of it. Pornographic. And when you're looking at images of it, reading literature about it, about adultery, about fornication, about uncleanness, uncleanness, once again, moral uncleanness. He's not talking about uncleanness of the body, but moral uncleanness. Filthy in your mind. Lewdness, that which incites lust, which is exactly what this does, by definition. That's exactly what this does. By definition, it incites lust. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Stop. And the like. Oh, pornography isn't on the list. And the like is on the list. And pornography is like adultery and fornication and uncleanness and lewdness. It surely is. It's like every one of those things and more. Don't tell me pornography is not on the list. It is. Maybe not spelled out, maybe not in words, but in principle. It is there. And that's the beautiful thing about God's Word. It contains principles that are adaptable to any culture and any time, you see. It is adaptable. You take these principles and you cannot walk away and say, pornography is no big deal. It is a big deal. And it's wrong. And it's sinful. Turn your Bibles now to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You know, another issue with pornography is addiction. A lot of times I use these verses when I'm talking about smoking or drinking or gambling and with good reason. But I want you to think about how this principle also applies to pornography. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now when he says all things are lawful, just to make sure we're clear on this, he doesn't, he's not saying here fornication is lawful. In fact, if you back up here, verse 9 and 10, he just gave a whole list of things. Uh, verse 9, fornicators and idolaters and adulterers. And in verse 10, he concludes, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. So when he says two verses later, all things are lawful, he's not saying those things are lawful. He's talking about, as the next verse shows us, food. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. When he says all things, he means all foods. All foods are lawful. But then as he discusses that, he says something might be lawful, verse 12, but it might not be helpful. It might not be the best thing for you. And all things are lawful. It might be lawful, but I will not be brought under the power of any. What he's saying here is you've got to be in control of yourself at all times. You can't let things get, that's why I use this to talk about smoking. Sometimes that tobacco weed gets a hold of us, doesn't it? Got to have it. Got to have that cigarette. Can't afford to pay my light bill, but I'm going to have my cigarettes. That's a problem. That's a problem. And some people do the same thing with alcohol. Can't pay my light bill, but I'm going to have my beer. I'm going to have my beer. Can't pay my light bill, but I'm going to have my lottery tickets. That's a problem. And some people are the same way with pornography. Can't pay this bill, can't pay that bill, but I'm going to have my dirty literature. You better believe I'm going to have that. That's a problem. And at the heart of that is addiction, isn't it? You've lost control of yourself. You have lost control of yourself. And now your lusts control you. 
and the Bible is telling us you can't let that happen in any area but we're talking specifically about this area you just can't let that kind of thing happen in any area now how can I break addiction you know that's that's easier said than done sometimes because once the addiction has set in it isn't like flipping a switch it isn't like well I'm just not gonna do that anymore just use smoking as an example I was gonna throw them down well that that's easier said than done it takes a little effort but the effort must be made the effort must be made take your Bibles and turn to Philippians 4 we'll probably get to this verse in our Bible study tonight but it makes a good time to ring it in right here as well you see I said the problem was the heart remember that the problems the heart and I also said that the Bible heart is up here between the ears it's the brain you see and we've got to control what goes into the brain what goes into the mind where you focus what kind of music are you listening to what kind of television shows are you watching what kind of books are you reading all of that is going to affect the mind now with that background look here at Philippians 4 and verse 8 finally brethren whatsoever things are true whatsoever things are noble whatsoever things are just whatsoever things are pure whatsoever things are lovely whatsoever things are of good report if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy meditate on these things put your mind on positive things instead of the negative stop thinking about your cigarettes stop thinking about the booze stop thinking about the lottery ticket stop thinking about the pornography and you do that by changing your thinking watch what you put into your brain garbage in garbage out you see so stop putting the garbage in and start putting positive things here and just go through that list pornography just won't fit pornography is not true it's false pornography is not noble it's ignoble pornography is not just pornography is not pure pornography is not lovely pornography is not of good report pornography is not virtuous it is not praiseworthy stop pumping that garbage into your mind renew your remember the scripture talks about that doesn't it? renewed in the spirit of your mind it all starts there doesn't it half of our battles with sin are fought right here we get this straight everything else falls into place got to get our thinking straight got to get our mind straight got to get our brain straight so you want to avoid addiction you got to think about what you put into your mind and what your mind is focusing on in Colossians chapter 3 a few more scriptures here I want to give you these are all pertinent and so they're all important I want to make sure we look at every single one of them Colossians 3 verses 5 through 7 therefore put to death your members which are on the earth fornication uncleanness passion evil desire and covetousness which is idolatry because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked in them when you lived in them. notice again that these Christians had engaged, engaged in some of these things in their past but they put it to death they put it behind them and you can do that too and you should do that you see in Romans 13 a couple more verses here and I'll be done with you Romans 13 near the end of the chapter here in fact I'm going to bring in verse 13 for a little context let us walk properly walk again the way you conduct your life properly as in the day not in revelry and drunkenness did you know revelry and drunkenness go hand in hand one of these days I'm going to develop that sermon things that go hand in hand revelry and drunkenness they go hand in hand lewdness and lust did you know they go hand in hand I'm going to return to that in just a second and strife and envy those things go hand in hand so there's three things that go hand in hand there revelry and drunkenness they go together lewdness and lust they go together strife and envy they go together now in the old King James that middle section there lewdness and lust is what my new King James says the old King James says chambering and wantonness now that's strange language to us but chambering has to do with the bedchamber and in the Greek language the word bed was sometimes used euphemistically for sex so he's talking about fornication you see and so fornication and lewdness chambering and wantonness they go hand in hand don't they they go together they go together and then the next verse but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh don't give it any quarter cut it off throw that laptop away 
throw that iPhone away if that's your problem. If you can't stop looking at pornography on an iPhone, it's time to get rid of it. You can get by without a phone. We did it for years. Years and years we did it. Get rid of whatever it is that's causing the problem. One more verse. Hebrews 13 and verse 4. This is another place where the word bet is used, by the way. I just got, went over that in Romans 13. Hebrews 13 and verse 4. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. The word bed there is being used euphemistically. What happens in the bed? He's not talking about the box springs and the mattress, but he's talking about what happens there with the husband and the wife. Marriage is honorable, and the bed, that act of love between husband and wife, is undefiled. That is pure and holy and righteous. But, on the flip side, fornicators and adulterers God will judge. And what that tells us is this. The only place, the only legitimate place for sexual activity is in a lawful marriage. Anything outside of that, anything outside of that is unacceptable. Fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Now I understand, if we wrap this up, I understand this is unpleasant. You ought to be in my shoes trying to talk about it. I understand that it's unpleasant. But it is necessary. You would be surprised to know the number of people, even among Christians, who struggle with this who have issues with this. And the best defense is a good offense. We need to know why pornography is wrong. Hopefully I've accomplished that in this lesson. We need to know how to apply the principles of the scriptures to this sin. And we don't need to know how to escape this sin. Hopefully, once again, I've accomplished those things in this lesson. But as we wrap this up, let me bring it around and talk about, for just a minute, the principles of salvation. You know, that's the beauty of the gospel. You've got to lay a lot of bad news on people. Sin is bad. Sin is terrible. Sin condemns. Sin sends to hell. And you've got to lay all that bad news on people. But it's important because that's what motivates them to want to change. I've got to do something now. And here comes the good news. That's what gospel means, good news. Now, so you've got to lay the bad news on first, and then comes the good news. And so the good news is you don't have to be locked into this. The good news is you can escape this. The good news is you can be forgiven of this if you escape, if you repent. And so, by way of invitation, I want you to think about your Savior, Jehovah Jireh. Jesus provided as a sacrifice for our sins. Offering his life on the cross, shedding his blood so that my sins could be forgiven. Even this, yes, even this, it can be forgiven. It can be washed away and you can be as pure and sinless as the day you were born because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh boy, I want that. I want that. How can I have that? Put your faith in Christ. Don't put your faith in me. I'm going to let you down. Put your faith in the Lord. Put your faith in Christ. Believe he's the son of God. Believe he died for you. Believe he's your king. Repent of your sins, even this one. Turn away from it. Stop doing it. Work at improving yourself. Confess your faith. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And be baptized. In that watery grave, God washes away your sins. It's not that the water has any power at all. The power is in your faith, and the power is in the blood of Christ. And when those two things come together, your faith and the blood of Christ, and you come down into that water, all of those sins are gone. I heard a sermon, or maybe it was an article I saw years ago, and sometimes the story is told of, of Naaman in the Old Testament, you know. Naaman was cleansed of his leprosy. And someone said, well, there wasn't, really wasn't anything in the water that cleansed uh, Naaman, but actually there was. Naaman. Naaman was in the water. And the same thing's going to hold true for you. Oh, there's nothing in this water but when you get in there, and when you get in there by faith, when you get in there trusting in the Lord that He'll wash away your sins, mark it down. They will be washed away. The Lord has spoken. The Lord has promised. If you're willing to do that this morning, we want you to come right now while we stand, while we sing.